Good afternoon, good afternoon. It's a blessing once again to be able to spend time looking into the Word of God. We have a very interesting lesson today and one in which we actually have a chance to see eternity and time uh, merge and come together at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're looking over in John, the first chapter of John, I saw the prelude to it. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pause once again to thank you so very much for this privilege we have to be able to ha have you communicate with us, and we in turn, and we pray that our eyes, our ears, and our hearts are open so that we can receive those things that you desire to share with us. Then, Father, we pray that you would challenge our hearts to take those things that we hear and turn them into reality, internal, internalize them so that we can live consistent with your directives and know and become like the Lord Jesus Christ. In particular, we pray that your spirit would lead us, assume his rightful place as our instructor, and let us be instructed by him. Thank you for one more time being able to look into your word to hear your truths. This prayer we submit in the name of Jesus, even the Christ, your son. Amen. Communicating remotely can be an exciting way of initially meeting and getting, uh, getting acquainted with someone. You can share interesting insights about yourselves, discover similarities, and identify common aspirations. However, as people get to become more and more aware of a person's uniqueness and realize there's a mutual fascination with the other individual, the desire to meet and interact face-to-face -face is typically heightened. Such an encounter will allow the opportunity to answer questions about the other individual, such as, what is it like to be with them? What things can we really enjoy together? What is their real personality? Interestingly, the Lord have, had been communicating with mankind through his called out people, the Jews, for years and years and years. At the appropriate time, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to give mankind the opportunity to get to know him up close and personal. The lesson today introduced God, the son, in order to make it clear he represented all that God had said and the fullness of God. Of God. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This verse encapsulates the motivation for God sending Christ to meet mankind and draw humanity to God. Specifically, the lesson today presents Christ as the eternal word who comes to establish a personal relationship with all those who would receive him. He comes from eternity into time and is present with the people God has created. The focus text is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And the title of today's lesson is The Word Becomes Flesh. The scripture reads thusly. Would you please follow me as I read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 13, excuse me, 1 through 14, and then we will go into what God's word says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made 
through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many had received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And finally, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen to the word of God. Now, first of all, before we get started, let me apologize. I had a little uh, incident and, and uh, my knee is giving me a little trouble, so uh, bear with me as we go through this. Let us uh, please join me, should I say, in investigating the text by first of all reviewing the eternal word, the engaging witness, then the expansive work, and wrap it up by the empowering word. First of all, let's look at the eternal word in verses 1 through 5. The author of this gospel described the word as the ultimate manifestation of the God from the beginning. So first of all, look at the eternality of the eternal word. Notice what he said. In the beginning was the word. So he makes it very clear that the word didn't start at a certain point in time. The word was there before the beginning. Then it says, the word, and, and the, the Greek uh, word that's used, logos, and it's a reflection of communicating, sharing, transmitting what a person is, what a person is thinking, what a person is all about. So he, he says, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning. God's intent, God's understanding, God's purpose, God's definition of things was there. And the word is the instrument that that can be communicated. So it says, in the beginning, before time started, the word existed. The word was there. And then he goes on to say, and the word was with God. So we have an opportunity to recognize that the word, word, the very essence of the word was one in which they were connected to, associated with God. Also identifying that the word was something different from God per se, as it was indicating, implying that there is some personality other than what we had perceived as God. And, and we, as we will see later on, God becomes clear to us as the Father. So he says, in the beginning, the word was with God. But then it goes on and gives the even clearer indication of the word. Is the, and the word was God. So we see that there's this presence with God, indicating some separate personality or some separate person. But it, this person was of the very same essence, the very same existence that was God. In other words, whatever God was, the word was. And as we look at this, the, the statement, the way it's phrased, it addresses the Hebrew mind and concept of God as well as challenging the views of the Romans and the Greeks and, and in other words, the Gentiles. Because philosophically, there was this concept of the Logos uh, with them being some 
uh, description of what intelligence was, how things were operated, the order that existed. So we see that what John, this statement that John's making challenges mankind, period, regardless of whether you were a Jew or whether you were Gentile. And it disrupts the normal thinking that people had been going through because the Jews viewed God as somewhat of a father, this one person, this one entity. In fact, the, the, the Shema says, starts off by, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And now the Jews are saying, There is God. But then there's another aspect to God, the word that which is communicated. And notice what it's like in the beginning. It basically reaches back and taps into what started in Genesis 1-1 when God was identified as being the one who orchestrated the creation of, of life. So it ties those together. It shows how far back we're talking about, way beyond, our, beyond the beginning. When the beginning got here, the word was here. God was here. So now he goes on to state that in verse 2, he was in the beginning with God. So he stated, first of all, he's with God, implying that there was some personality that was in the presence of God. Then he goes on to say that personality was God. So it begins to uh, unfold for us this idea of this triune Godhead we, we serve. The one God who exists in three persons. And then he said he was in the beginning with God. So he reemphasizes the fact that the word is not something that came into existence, but the word was here in time and eternity. Then we see what the effect of the word is operation. Verses 3 through 5 says, All things were made by him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So we see here the effect of the word. It says, All things were made by him. So the word is the vehicle, the instrument that brought creation into existence. Remember, the Bible tells us, and God said, let there be. So God spoke. In other words, the word of God brought into existence life. And here we see what, who the word of God is. And then he said, not only did he say was made through him, so he was the instrument that brought things into existence. And he goes in and re, he shows us the positive side. Says he made them. Then he goes on to let us know from a ne with a negative statement: without him, nothing was made that was made. So, in other words, anything that came into existence, the only way it was created or brought into existence was through the word. The word brought it into existence. And then he said, in him was life. So life emanated. What life is emanated from this word that they're referring to. And notice they keep referring to him indicating the person, the personality of this word. And the life was the light of men. So the life that came, that emanated from the word, provided light and opportunity to comprehend, to see, to understand, to recognize the things that were going on, life in itself. And, and, and he speaks, he's speaking of, in essence of just beyond the, the living and breathing, but the overall the ability to be cognizant of that which is beyond us and tied into him. And then 
He said it was a light of men. So here, this light, this opportunity to see. What happens when, when light is there? Light exposes things, gives us a chance to see what is there what, and how we can relate to it, what direction we can go, what things are about. It gives us a chance to observe and and analyze and reflect on and have some sense of direction. So his life was the light of men. In other words, his life provided an opportunity to see that which we should really be following after and understanding. And then he said, and the light shines in the darkness. As you know, darkness is the absence of light. So as Light shines, the darkness fades. And so he said, this light shined in the darkness. So this light brought visibility to that which had been uh, unseeable because of it being dark. And it's kind of relating to our, to our world, how our world was dark and gloomy. Just think about before Christ called, came on the scene, uh, there had been word from God that was shared by the Jews, but remember how the Jews had so uh, covered God's word with their traditions, it was difficult to really comprehend God's intent and purposes in his word. Whereas now the light has come in and all the darkness that has been in the world has been eliminated and moved aside. So now uh, there's an opportunity to see what is going on to see the reality of what life is and what it's about. But then he said, uh, uh, and the darkness did not comprehend it. In other words, the, the, the word can be translated in effect saying that uh, the light could not overcome, excuse me, the darkness could not overcome the light. The light was there. And as again, let's never lose sight of the fact that as light moves in, Darkness dissipates, uh, vanishes, and fades away. So the light, const constant reminder of the environment that mankind was in and what opportunities there might be to live in this, this life. So now let's move to the next segment, the engaging witness. Notice in verses 6 through through eight, what it says, excuse me, six through nine, what it says. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. First of all, this person said there was a man sent from God named John. So first of all, we have a chance to identify who this person is. And this is really re referencing John the Baptist. And if you look back in the Old Testament, uh, it had Isaiah reminded us and, and, and Malachi indicated to us that there would be someone coming to bear witness, to open the way so that at the light would be able to come in and be seen and be observed and be focused on. So he said, this is John the Baptist that it's referring to. And notice it said he was sent from God. His mission, his sole purpose was to be able to be one who would provide uh, a witness for the light, the Lord Jesus Christ coming on, coming on. He said, he would bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. So he's pointing to the fact that Christ is coming, the light. We'll see further over in John where he refers to himself as the light of the world. The book of John is very unique. It, it, it's uh, over 90% of the material in the book of John is not in the other Gospels. And John's sole focus, in fact, over in chapter 20, he lets us know that he wants those who are 
able to look at what he's saying to recognize that Jesus is the Christ and that life, eternal life, comes through receiving and believing him. And so now we see here that John is bearing witness. John's sole purpose is to bear witness of this light, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that people in turn may accept him, may believe in the reality of him. We quoted earlier, for God so loved the world. So John was one who was pointing toward this person that God had sent to put on display the vastness of his love and his desire to connect and have a relationship with his creation. Then it goes on to let us know that he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. So it makes it very clear that John was not here to bring attention to himself. In fact, over in chapter 3 of, of John, he makes a statement, I must decrease so that he can increase. So we see that John's total purpose is not self-centered, but it is Christ-centered, focusing on him, which reminds us that, uh, of ourselves. We should not be caught up in what God is doing for us and what he is doing with us, but only caught up in pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, expressing how thankful we are that we know him and can be instruments that that can share him with others. And then it goes on, we go on from there uh, <clears throat> to look at the empowering, excuse me, the expansive work of this, of this light that is coming to the world. The true light that John presented then challenged those who know the word and any who received him by the will of God if they <clears throat> were accepted. Anybody who would receive him were accepted by God. And we're going to look at verses 10 through 13. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. First of all, look at recognition. Christ said was in the world. Just think about this. The one who had brought the world into existence, the one who had set everything in order, in place, so that life could be lived and enjoyed, he came into the world, but yet, the world did not know him. The one who did everything for us. The one who allows, uh, provides resources necessary to live. The one who provides all that we can enjoy in life. The giver of every good and per perfect gift. He's the one who came into the world, yet... He was unrecognizable by the world. Now, that is amazing when you stop to think about it. You would think that someone who is responsible for, for all the goodness that you're able to partake of, that would be an awareness of him as he comes into the world. Yet the world did not know him. And then he goes on to say, he came into his own and his own did not receive him. So let's look at, at the reception he got. First of all, the world, uh, his creation, didn't recognize him. Then he came to his own, speaking more in terms of the Jews, the, the Israelites, the ones who had been given the word of God. Remember we started off talking about in the beginning was the word. The one who had been deliverers of God's communication to mankind. God had communicated to mankind really about Christ, the ultimate communicator. And yet, when he came to those who should have known him because they had had this 
supposed intimate relationship with God all this time and had been able to commune with God, interact with God through Moses and all the prophets and then all the words that had been defined by which they could, should have been able to understand who God was and what God expected. They didn't recognize it. And goes on, they didn't even receive him. Remember the Jews rejected Jesus? Because he did not fit according to their traditions, the things that they expected. In reality, instead of focusing on what God had said and what God was doing, they were focused on how they had basically taken God's word and just wrapped it in their tr traditions to make things comfortable, if you will, for them. So he came into his own and they did not receive him. However, it wasn't just complete, it wasn't just complete disconnect. For he said, for as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. And we know the disciples, for example, accepted him. They were Jews. So there were some who were able to break through the barrier that had been created, the blindness that had been created by these traditions that had encapsulated us trapped, should I say, inside the word of God so they could not be completely understood and adhered to. So then those who did accept him, they were brought in to become a part of, of Christ. Um, so he said, as many as received him, he gave them the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So in other words, as Peter, James, John, the disciples, those that they influenced as they accepted Christ, he brought them into his fold as his mission was to, to bring uh, those into a relationship with God. And then he goes on and explains uh, why this result came about, why some did accept him. Notice it says, for who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So it, it reminds us, remember over in chapter 3, where, it's, where Christ tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, you must have this transformation from where you were it tied up in worldly beliefs and worldly traditions and then allow yourself to be enlightened, renewed, so that you have an opportunity to see God, understand God, and it's by God's will. God is the one who's drawing uh, those to him. It's not something, we, we have this misconception that we go around seeking for God. God is the one seeking for us. We have no idea where to find God, but God knows exactly where we are. So when God touches us and we are receptive to him, we are then born again, as we say, as indicated, we are renewed so that we are then reflective of ones who have accepted the will of God. It's God's will that all, we're told it's God's will that all should be saved. And those who accept him will be brought, touched, and drawn into his family. So, so we, we see here that, that those who did receive him were those who were born, not in the traditional process of being born into this world physically or through some willful act on our part that I, I want to be a child of God, but it's something that God has touched us with, instilled in us, brought us to be a part of him. So we, we see that it, his work was to go out and share and communicate to God and who he is. This is, this is Christ Jesus, who he is, so that people can see clearly the 
hope that only comes from knowing God and living according to his will. So finally, let's get to this last segment, the empowering worth, this great, great uh, passage. Now, one of the things we, we uh, uh, need, need to keep in mind, this that we're going through makes it very clear that Christ was all God and all man. In fact, uh, there's this term we use, the theanthropic person. In other words, the God-man person. 100% God, 100% man. Amazingly, Christ has come and has maintained, should I say, it's still God. And that's what we're told in the, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. So Christ is 100% God. And then what we're about to see is he is 100% man. Some way those natures have not interfered with each other. But God has been able to, through Christ Jesus, manifest in mankind exactly what God intended for mankind to be. So there's this perfect harmony between the, the natures of man and God. So let's, let's look at what, what he tells us here. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The author highlighted this prologue. Let's go over this, this, actually verses 1 through 18, uh, in effect a prologue, an introduction to this book. It, it points to what this book is about, and who this book is about. John's mission is to show that Jesus is the Son of God and also that he is a, a man who is able to reconcile to mankind and God, this, this brokenness that had come about because of sin, Christ was able to resolve that brokenness and bring them together. So we see that uh, the author highlighted in this prologue by sharing the unique, glorious, empowering nature of the word thus emphasizing his incomparably boundless worth. First of all, look at the presence. He said, the word was made flesh. As he started out clarifying who the word is and was in the initial verses, he said, the word in the beginning was the word, word, word was with God, and the word was God. So this God had now, it said, become flesh. In other words, God had put his godliness inside a human body. So now the nature of mankind, someone who's relatable to the pain, the agonies, the challenges that we go through in life, the turmoil. Remember he said, in this world you shall suffer tribulation. All that mankind has to go through, Christ as a man related to those. Remember he said he did everything that man did yet without sin. So he some way merged Time and eternity, that which was timeless, God, and that which was temporary, mankind, he merged them into this one person. The word became flesh. The word was in a position where it could be touched, it could be seen, it could be heard. In fact, over in 1 John, he, he alludes to the fact that they saw him. They 
touched them. They heard him. So the all that God is, all that God desires to share, all that God desires to communicate is in Christ Jesus. In fact, we're told he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So first of all, we see his presence. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Then, he's, let's look at his perception. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The word becoming flesh did not diminish the fact that he could be perceived as being totally beyond anything that mankind had encountered before. We mentioned they saw him, they heard him, they touched him. And he said, his glory, they were able to recognize the excellence, the, the incomparable excellence of God in Christ Jesus. And then he stated that this glory was a reflection of, the, of his unique relationship with. The Father, he said, the only begotten of the Father. Remember, we started off talking about in the beginning of the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And now we begin to see the, uh, in, more, in more clarity, the two persons, eventually three persons, we'll see, of the Godhead. One God, but these personalities, these persons that are in the Godhead. And so they beheld his glory and recognized the only way that this glory, this excellence could be shown, to be, could be displayed was because it was from God. And so he said he was the only begotten of the Father. That was this unique relationship between Christ Jesus and the Father, the Son and the Father, the very same essence, the same person with these two personalities. And Christ put on display who God is and what he's about. You know, as old thought we have that if a person is someone's child, they should reflect some attributes in all of that person. Well, Christ did it to the utmost. He reflected all of God, all of his glory, all of his greatness, all of his majesty. So we see that Christ Jesus was the one that our focus should be on, the one that the world should recognize him as, as we often refer to, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And finally, his pervasiveness is that full of grace and truth. Notice it didn't say he just had grace or just he had truth. But there was nothing else in him but grace and truth to the overflow, to the max, full of grace and truth. What is grace? Grace is God's the manifestation of his unconditional love to do what is right for us. Uh, some take grace, the acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense because of who Christ was and is and what he has done. He has given himself so that God's unmerited favor, God's boundless ability to bless and take care of us can be manifest because what Christ Jesus did, and then the response of accepting him by those who come into the family. And he said, full of grace and truth. So Christ, everything he did was the truth that we can stand on. In fact, he said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make ye free. And he is the truth. Remember, he told us, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. In fact, this 
Gospel of John uh, uses seven very powerful statements of the fact that he is self-existence. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. He goes on and just let us, lets us know his greatness, his majesty, his incomparability. Christ is full of grace, was, is, and will be full of grace and truth to the overflow. So we see that, that Christ is the one that our attention should be on. John didn't go into, as Matthew and Luke did, to talk about his birth, his earthly birth, nor uh, did he uh, focus on his time in Nazareth as uh, Mark did in, in trying to show. I mean, uh, Matthew was basically showing he, the king. He was the one who had who had who was descendant of David and can be a king in the kingly line. Mark displayed for us that he was the one who came to serve, to seek and save those who are lost. Luke relates to us that he is human being. He's the son of man. But what John was trying to make sure that we understood is this Christ Jesus is God. And we owe everything to him. Our attention should be wrapped up and tied up in him. So we have gone through and looked at this, this prologue that started off indicating that from eternity past, the word has existed. In fact, on the other side of the beginning, the word was here. And then the word was God. Then we took a look at his purpose in coming. Uh, he's the one who communicated ultimately who God was. And then he gave this real clear definition of the fact to make sure that there's no mistake. Christ was not some illusion. Christ came in person, in the flesh. He was tangible, someone that you could interact with. And then Accordingly, we should be responding to him because of who he is. So in summary, the Lord Jesus Christ came and made, the unknowable, made known the unknowable. He allowed you to reach to the unreachable and to approach the unapproachable. As the writer of Hebrews stated definitively, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke past it, spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed, appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, Sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance attained a more excellent name than they. Thus, the Lord has come and engaged mankind with the worth, work, and witness of the word of God. God, accordingly, there is no excuse but to recognize and receive him. Submit to him today and partake of the wonders of abundant life and in the hope of the future of glory with him. God bless you and God keep you and have a blessed, blessed week.